So um, with me today, I have horror and dark fantasy author, Carver Pike. Carver, hello, thank you for being here. Ah, thank you for having me, I'm excited. Um, likewise, so um, which genre do you write in and how do you define that genre? Uh, I write mostly horror for the, that's my main genre and then I do dabble in dark I call it dark fantasy because it's not quite high fantasy not ogres and elves and that kind of thing and dragons and stuff but alternate dim dimensions and uh, that kind of stuff but mostly horror I kind of delve into extreme horror it seems lately uh, I would definitely define it as uh well, horror seems to be defined as anything that kind of scares you or disgusts you. But lately, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of, I don't want to say controversy, but a lot of talk online, especially about what is horror, because especially with like the Books of Horror group on Facebook and some of the, the groups, people have come in and, for example, my friend Donna Latham mentioned this in, in a podcast recently someone came into one of the groups and, and mentioned Harry Potter and said, you know, she considered this horror and mentioned it. And immediately everyone attacked this person and said, that's, that's not horror. Get that out of here. How, how dare you call that horror? What are you thinking? And, but I mean, to this person that was considered horror, I mean, you know, to each person, I mean, it's kind of subjective, right? I mean, what scares you, frightens you or disgusts you really is, is horror, right? So Absolutely. I mean, I mean, to many people, the elephant man is horror, right? Or whatever happened to baby Jane, I mean, that's horror. But to someone else, that might not be, that might be more thriller or suspenseful or, right? I mean, yeah. so to me, that's, a, I think it's really subjective, but I think if it creeps you out, if it gets to you, if it kind of scares you or frightens you in any way, and um, it's funny because as an author, I tend to ask myself that question a lot. Sometimes I'm writing a book and I, I ask myself, is this scary enough? I mean, it, I don't sometimes wonder, you know, I wonder, is this horror? Is what I'm writing scary? But does it have to be? I mean, sometimes it's just creepy enough, just enough to get under the skin, just enough to disgust someone or bother somebody. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, boo, or, you know, enough to make you not sleep at night. It just needs to stick with you and bother you a little bit to be yeah, considered I mean, horror, I think. In Duns Macabre, Stephen King points out that um, he thinks horror works on two levels. There's sort of like the gets under your skin and unnerves you and unsettles you level of horror. But above that, there's the gross out, chewed up food type of horror. And yeah, the blood and the gore. And he actually says um, he doesn't mind whichever he uses, so long as it gets the right effect on the reader. And I take on board what you're saying as well about say the Harry Potters I mean one of the scariest films I watched when I was growing up was Robocop yeah <laughs> uh, I mean it's sort of like a science fictiony crime type thing but the violence that was aimed towards the guy who eventually becomes Robocop was just so over the top it, it genuinely upset me whilst I was watching it and yeah I still find it too horrifying to watch nowadays um, or like the dark crystal do you remember that Yes. Dark Crystal scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> and I don't think those were meant to be horror, but <laughs> those movies creeped me out when I was little. So. <laughs> I had a group of students today talking about uh, the never-ending story and the horse that dies in that. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> were traumatized, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I think you're right. It is very, very subjective. And one person's horror can be another person's comedy. Um, I know I sat through... Um, I sat through One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest twice and the first time I watched it with a friend and we were just in hysterics because we thought it was really, really funny. And then I watched it on my own and thought, this isn't even funny. This is just so, so sad and ended up crying because, yeah, it was <laughs> butt wrenching. Yeah. Um, so what's your writing schedule? It's, um, it's, it's changed, actually, because now I'm not a full time author. I would like to say that I am. I still do. I work from home, so I still do part-time work um i edit videos for a software company so i do have the liberty of working from home that's nice uh, so what i do is as long as the work gets done i don't have a exact schedule for my day job work so i found that i do not allow myself to write during the weekend because i like to spend time 
with the woman that I'm actually marrying tomorrow. So we're doing shut the front door. Uh, yeah, we're getting married tomorrow. Congratulations! So, thank, thank you very much. It's just the, the the legal wedding tomorrow, and then we'll have a ceremony later. But but um, I tried very much. I've made the mistake of spending too much time writing, and in my head, as an author, you know, we spend a lot of time in our head. So I have made it to where I do not write in the evening, and I don't write on the weekends, which drives me batshit crazy. Because as as I just said, we spend a lot of time in our head. So over the weekend, I get so many ideas and I have so much going on in my mind that I found I, I, I have to write Monday and Tuesday at least. Like that, those are my days to spill everything onto the paper. So I reserve Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are my days to work on my day job stuff. And then I, I fit some writing into those days too. But Monday and Tuesday are mostly my days to only write and only do author related stuff. So that's um, really interesting. Just, um... So does it actually work as a pent up way of doing it then by resisting the urge to do any writing over the weekend? Does that mean Monday and Tuesday you're splurging a hell of a lot on the page? Yes, <laughs> it does. It does actually help a lot. I do. I do cheat a little bit like when Jules is, is my fiance. So when Jules falls asleep at night, I'll sometimes cheat at least on my phone and take some notes and stuff like that just to get a little bit of it out. But yes, on Monday and Tuesday, I'm just cra crazy writing. So I get the words out. And then on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I do a little bit of writing, mostly some editing and stuff like that. But most of my just flat out writing takes place the first two days of the week. So. Wow. Yeah. Uh, um, I, yeah. Um, I can't tell you how useful that is to know that, yeah, um, because we keep getting told your writing schedule must be, oh, everybody must like try and get a couple of hours done every day or so many words per day. But the whole idea of taking the weekends off and then that gives you almost like a superpower of writing. Um, yeah, I know my students are going to get a lot out of that. What's most important to you, plot or character? I think, man, that's a tough one. Isn't it just... That, that, that's a really tough question because I want to say they're equally as important, but I want, I want to say the plot to me is more important in the beginning to, for the idea. Like plot, obviously, when you come up with the idea, like I can, um, uh, for example, I was driving down the highway one day and I just saw a rickety old wagon, kind of a tra uh, camper being pulled down the highway. And I thought, man, what if, what if, that was a really creepy old religious couple driving that camper. And I, and I live in West Virginia. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of creepy old religious couples mm -hmm. in West Virginia. So I'm up in the mountains and I thought, what if, you know, this, this camper just drove around and, and tried to find young college kids that were blasting rock and roll and doing drugs and just tried to teach them a lesson, you know, and, but then that only gets you so far the plot, right? Because now I'm all now I've already started diving into the characters because I've already gotten into this creepy old religious couple. So at some point you get into the character development, and I I'm a very strong believer in character development. Um, I've had people tell me, especially I've had authors tell me that who write short stories that they don't necessarily feel the need to try to squeeze character development into short stories because they're short and they just want to get the story out and. I can't tell you how wrong I feel that that is. Um, if you don't feel anything for the characters in a story, you don't care if they live or die. You don't really feel any need to get through that story. Like how many times have we watched a horror movie and you don't really care to get through the rest of it, through the end of it, because you don't like any of the characters. If they're all, uh, I don't know how bad, how much I have to watch my language in this uh, video, but <laughs> whatever you want, yeah. Um, if, they're, if, if they're all a bunch of assholes and you really have no feelings for any of them, if there are no redeemable qualities in any of the characters, unless you're just hanging out and having fun and you really are enjoying watching them just get hacked to pieces because you hate them that much, usually if there aren't at least a, at least one one or two characters that you care about, you don't really feel like investing a full two hours in watching this movie, right? And it's kind of the same way with a story. So even in a short story, if you can if you can invest even two sentences in talking about how this guy, for example, okay, let's say you have a short story that's only ten thousand words. Mm -hmm. In a ten thousand word story, you can at least in a couple of sentences explain why James dropped out of college and gave up his college uh, 
his scholarship to play college baseball to raise his two little sisters because their parents died. And he wants to make sure that he can take care of his younger sisters, you know, yeah. and raise them so that they can go on and go on to college. I mean, it might take two or three sentences, but right there you've shown that he's willing to give up everything for his younger sisters and he's a good guy. And I mean, it might just take a few sentences to make you actually care a little bit about him and worry about his sisters or something. You know what I mean? But it places him as somebody who you've got empathy for and somebody who is, yeah, you want to see them get to the successful conclusion of the story. Whereas right. if it's just James who's, um, yeah, yeah, who's on the phone or doing something anodyne or benign. In that case, we don't really give a crap. Yeah, completely yeah. get that. It is such a balancing act, isn't it, between plot and between character? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean... Um, have you read um, Joe Hill's um, 21st Century, 20th Century Ghosts? No, I actually just bought it. I just bought it at, like, last week. I'm, I'm looking at it. It's on my, I'm on my shelf right now. I just bought it because I saw the movie poster for Black Phone that's coming out. All right. And that's that's from that collection of stories. So they're, I don't know if you know that they're putting out that movie, Black Phone. No, they didn't. Yeah, that's with Ethan Hawke, I think, is in it. Ethan Hunt, Hawke which I always get the one that's from Mission Impossible confused with the actor. <laughs> yeah, Ethan but, um, Mission Impossible, yeah. Ethan Hawke was um, the remake of um, Precinct 13. Um, yeah. Uh, in that one, it's got one of my favorite, in that collection, it's got one of my favorite short stories of all time, which is pop art. And his characterization in that is just absolutely perfect. And I'm not going to say anything more because you've not read the story and you've got the book in front of you. And you're going to love that one. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some really, really quality stories in that one, but pop art just blew my mind. What piece of writing advice? I'm rolling my R's again, Anna. What piece of writing advice would you give to anyone who's just starting out? <laughs> you know, it's so funny is I'm going to kind of contradict what I told you earlier. So <laughs> when I with the whole write every day kind of thing. So even though I don't write every. I do write a little something every day for the most part, because even Wednesday through Friday, I will usually write a little something every day. So um, I would still say to try to write a little something every day because it, it's, it's simple math. And I tell you that, especially if you're starting out as an author, because um, if you look at authors and especially in the indie horror author world, um, I see authors all the time come on and they say, I just don't know if I can do it. I see authors that are cranking out work and you crank out a lot of work. You have a lot of work out there. Like I've seen your, you've got a lot of work out there. You're very prolific. So um, I just um, shout about it a lot. I'm not that prolific. I just make a lot of things out. <laughs> but there are a lot of prolific authors out there. And for someone who's not, or who's just coming on the scene, that can be very intimidating. You know, they look at yeah. that and they say, I, I can never do that. I don't know how, I just don't see how that works. It's, it's basic math. I mean, if you can write a thousand words a day, right? Yep. If you can write a thousand words a day, that's 30,000 words a month. That's a, that's a novella a month, obviously, right? If you yep. can only do 500 words a day, which really is not much if you, I mean, if you sit down, 500 words is not very much. If you can do 500 words in a day, then that's still a novella in two months. I mean, for somebody new, that's not that bad, right? Yeah. Um, so I would still tell you to try to write every single day a little something because it will add up and you will finish a novella and you will finish a novel way faster than you believe you can. Like it will happen. You just have to force yourself to sit down and do it. Um, so that's, yeah. that's one piece of advice. I'm going to give you one, one other piece of advice too, is Please. don't listen to all the damn advice that you get because <laughs> I can tell you right now, I've been seeing it. It's crazy. It, it, I'm on most of the social media that's out there. I try, I try to use all of them, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, all that shit. I try to, it's a balancing act, but I try to use all of them a little bit. And especially on Twitter, um, the amount of advice that comes out is just insane. People are constantly trying to tell you what to do and what not to do. Try not to listen to most of it because what works for you is not going to necessarily be what worked for somebody else. I just saw someone the other day put a post up that said, like in all caps, authors, please stop dating your books by putting in modern 
um, references or pop art, pop culture references like TikTok and stuff. If you don't put pop culture references in your stories sometimes, then people don't relate to it, first of all. Stephen King does it all the time. I mean, yeah. if you don't mention TikTok in your story, sure. I mean, somebody 20 years from now, 30 years from now may not know what TikTok was, but they might. They might be like, oh, I remember TikTok. And, you know, they're, oh, I remember that. You know, I mean, it, it, it makes them relate to that story at the time the story was written. And I mean... I think what we tend to do with those stories, anyway, if we look at something and it's got a reference, if I'm, say, reading some story that somebody wrote a while back and they're talking about their MySpace page, my mind would automatically think, oh, well, if that was nowadays, it'd be their Facebook page or it'd be their, their other social yeah. media account. And you just make that small correction. I think the whole idea of all writers should stop doing this or should start doing this is just, yeah, as you say, um, <laughs> there is just so much bullshit um, advice out there. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've seen the one, I've seen the advice where you should only use the dialogue tag said. You should not, you should use every kind of dialogue tag. You should never use adverbs. You should never use, I mean, there's so many different types of writing advice out there. And I pick and choose. I mean, I do. Of course, I try to watch my adverbs, and you know what I mean. There's yeah. you, 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 you look, you take the advice for what it is, and you learn from it, and you try to apply it. But there's nothing that's the you. Know, nothing applies to everybody into all situations. I mean, just be careful with the advice that you take, because it will stop. First of all, it's going to stop you from writing. If you listen to all advice that's out there, you're going to look at the blank page and go, "I have no idea where to begin," because everybody's told me not to do everything. So there's nothing I can write that's going to please everybody. Um, I, you won't write. I can't tell you how useful that advice is going to be for, um, for the guys watching this. That's, um, yeah, because I think, I think the takeaway from that is when you sort of like see somebody giving out advice, take it as guidelines or guidance yeah. and say, this worked for me rather than, oh, all authors should, absolutely. Who do you read for pleasure? Uh, I tend to, I, I tend to read horror now and a lot of indie ho horror authors because I like to see what's going on in the world that I'm in. Yeah. And because now I'm starting to go to conventions and be on panels and things like that. And I kind of want to be able to speak to the world that I'm in and the authors that I'm around and what's going on around me and stuff like that. I love, I personally like to read the dark fantasy type. I love George R. R. Martin, like the Game of Thrones and all that stuff. I love Brent Weeks and those uh, fantasy type stuff, those authors. Uh, I just bought Joe Abercrombie's whole series, the uh, the First Law series, I think is what it's called, right. Blade Itself and all those. Like I just bought that whole three book series. Um, but for the most part on my Kindle, because I mostly read at night on my Kindle, I read a lot of horror. So um, I've got to ask about the George R. R. Martin stuff, um, and it's a completely incidental question, but um, did you watch the TV show? I did, yes. Um, will you be reading the rest of the books when they come out, or with the way the TV show seems to nosedive, are you sort of like thinking, I don't know, yeah, will you be reading the rest of them when they come out? I will, because I think he'll probably do something different, and I personally didn't dislike the series, like I... I tend to think it did its own thing. I, I think if they tried to wrap it all up with a pretty bow, I would have disliked it even more. Like, I think that the way they ended it made sense, kind of, given the past of... I, I, I guess you can't really say spoiler alert. I mean, there's... I mean, by now, everybody's probably watched it who has any interest in watching it, so... But, I mean, you know, given Daenerys and how crazy she kind of went towards the end and stuff like that, I mean... That's kind of how her family was. So, I mean, it's, you know, that's, I, I think if sense, they had yeah. gone different with it, it probably wouldn't, I think it made more sense almost how it ended. Like, so I was pleasantly surprised almost where everybody else hated it. And I thought it kind of was cool how they, how they just went balls to the wall with it. And they could have, they could have tied it up with a pretty pink ribbon and said, you know, here's the ending everybody would like. And, you know, I, I don't know. I like how it just went crazy and they pissed yeah. everybody off, but I think it took balls to do that. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's kind of fun pissing everybody off sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I'm only saying that because I've just got a two-day ban from Facebook for um, 
for a meme I'd shared back in January. Um, about Everybody is. It's crazy. I'm kind of scared of that, too. You know, did you see that one of the readers who's a what, big a fan of horror, Brad Tierney, just got permanently his account deleted that he's had for 12 years. Yeah. For, he doesn't even know why. He said he just got suddenly taken down, no warning, no reason why his account was permanently deleted, and he's had it for 12 years. Um, mine was because I'd shared um, in January, um, I'd shared a meme um, that the CDC was saying that um, handshakes could transfer disease. And then there was a picture of Jeffrey Dahmer, and it was sort of like him stopping the blender. Um, <laughs> which I was looking through their terms and conditions. And to me, it's there as a pun. It's there, you know, a handshake is sort of like a humorous joke. It's not me there saying, and aren't serial killers great? And isn't murder wonderful? Um, yeah. I'm afraid, it, I'm afraid to switch over to my old erotica pen name because I have a feeling it may not even exist anymore. <laughs> From the stuff that I used to post, it's probably like gone by now, my account. <laughs> It's probably been banned. Um, which brings us on nicely actually, to the next question. Um, uh, I was going to say, a lot of your Carver Pike fiction contains sex and violence. What do you see as a relationship between sex and violence and the horror story? I think, um, to me, sex and violence, sex, violence, and horror, it all kind of goes together. Even if you look as far back, if you look at horror and film, because I feel like it, it kind of was a part of film even before li literature for the most part. I mean, it, if you go back and look at the old 80s movies and stuff, it's all Friday the 13th and all that. Jason would wait until people were having sex before he would jump out and shish kebab them with his machete, you know, right through the tent and stuff. I mean, I think that evil, people are obviously more vulnerable when they're naked and they're in the throes of lovemaking and they're not, they don't care what's going on around them, you know. Sometimes even in the most ridiculous situations in the middle of like <laughs> scary situations it really doesn't matter what's going on that animalistic side of us comes out and when you're scary a lot of times you get horny and stuff like that and people just kind of just get wild and as they fall into like love making and stuff like i said they get become vulnerable and i think that evil whether it's in supernatural form you know paranormal form whatever or in the form of like human like a slasher or something like that they tend to strike when we're most vulnerable. So in, like I said, in all those old films, like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, all of those, there were some kind of, there were a lot of sex scenes in them. And then if you look at my books, especially like the Diablo Snuff series, um, my Diablo Snuff series, all of those books have very graphic sex in them. It, it tended to taper off towards the end. In the beginning, I was coming out of my erotic, I was an erotic author first. Right. And so it tended to play a bigger part in my first books, like the Diab like A Foreign Evil and The Grindhouse, my first two Diablo snuff books. And then I put less and less of it in as I kind of went on with that series. But usually it was used in that way. It was kind of like evil would, the evil entity of Diablo snuff would use sex to kind of lure people in, would use like sexy beings like um, prostitutes or would use... Um, just sexy beings and stuff like that would use sex to kind of entice people into situations and then kill them or, you know, so. And I think, yeah, what you're saying is, um, yeah, um, we are, we are our most vulnerable um, when we're being intimate. We're vulnerable emotionally and we're vulnerable uh, physically. And yeah, um, the horror of violence occurring at that time. Um, does make perfect sense. I was doing a lecture um, the other week about um, writing about writing horror stories, and one of the first things I got people to do was to describe what can you actually do in the dark, because if you're describing something that's naturally done in the dark, it's automatic that um, you can then make it slightly scary, because um, yeah, things coming out of the dark are <laughs> pretty fucking scary. If I'm being honest, yeah. yeah. Um, right. So. Although you're known for writing some pretty extreme horror scenes, you're also very considerate towards readers, and you try to make sure that no one enters your fiction without knowing that the envelope will be pushed. Do you think it's important that readers know what they're getting into before they open the front cover? Oh, definitely. And, and, I'm, and most, 
most of that comes from, I try to be careful, especially with young readers, because I was a reader at a very young age. I mean, I would sit in my middle school classes and read adult horror. And so I stumbled upon, most of mine at that age were, I would read a lot of novelizations of movie scripts, you know, movies like Lost Boys and the Halloween movies and stuff like that. And so I do have a concern that young readers, you know, 12 year olds, 13 year olds will pick up like my Diablo snuff series and stuff. So I like to be very clear right in the beginning and say this book does contain very graphic violence. Um, the problem is with Amazon, we have to be very careful with the wording that we use too, because they take our books and they throw them in that erotica slush pile, even if they're not erotica, you know? Yeah. So I found that out very early on just by calling, I used to call my books erotic horror because I wanted to be um, responsible and try to keep it out of hands of young readers. And then Amazon took all my books and put them in erotica and I didn't want them. I, they were, to me, they were more horror than erotica but they put them in erotica and then nobody looking for horror was finding them. So I had that, I had a big problem way in the beginning trying to get them out of erotica and get them back into horror. So yes, definitely. I, I like to, when the books, not all of my books are extreme horror. Not all of them have uh, graphic sex in them. For example, I have a book called Grad Night that's about uh, students getting revenge on their teachers. That doesn't have any sex in it at all. Um, Scalp is my book about parasitic head lice that jump from one head to the next and it's kind of almost like a zombie type story. That doesn't have, it has one scene in it that's uh, that's some semi-sexual. I mean, it does, a guy goes down on a girl, but it's not, I mean, it's not, it's kind of stopped as he's about to. I don't think there's, it doesn't go that deep into it. And then- um, Great phrasing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those, like, I don't think I have that wording on those two books, but for the, like all the Diablo snuff books I have right at the top, this is an extreme, a book, work of extreme horror. They're very graphic scenes. What I don't do, and this is kind of, this has always been a controversial thing, is I don't put trigger warnings, um, not exact phrased trigger warnings anyways. I do, like I said, I do put at the top that it's an, a work of extreme horror and there's very graphic content you know, reader be warned or beware or whatever, but I don't, I don't believe in putting, you know, trigger warning, this contains this type of scene, there's a, you know, a scene of animal cruelty or something, you know, the bullet point type trigger warnings, because it gives away the story, in my opinion, and, yeah. and, um, you know, if you do those, if some, some authors are, will do that, knowing that it is going to give away the twists and turns of their book, because they want to protect the reader, but in my opinion, especially when it's an extreme horror story. Readers usually do know, especially if they're a normal extreme horror reader, somebody who often reads extreme horror, they kind of know what they're getting into. They know if they're reading extreme horror, there's a chance that kind of stuff might be there. So I don't lay that out for them like that, a roadmap of all the you know trigger warnings and stuff that they might encounter, so. I don't think Amazon actually help us either because when there's, um... There's one of the parts where you've got to say, um, is the material um, suitable for an audience under the age of 18? Is it or under the age of 16? There's one of these tick boxes. And there's times when I've been sort of like looking at that thinking, well, I'm not sure that my material would be suitable for that particular, for a, an audience under 16. But then at the same time, I know that if I tick that box, as you said, it's going to get sort of like dumped into the, oh, this is erotic for some reason. Or, yeah, it just gets lost with... Um... I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't check that box out of fear of checking that box. And you know the other reason why I don't check that box? Because if you walk into Barnes & Noble, there's no section that says this way for books over 18 plus. So yeah. why is that fair that in Amazon I have to do that? You know what I mean? If I walk into a, a Books A Million... There's no neon sign that says this way if you're over the age of 18 for books, you know, for, <laughs> for books, you know, for people over the age of 18. So why is it that Amazon gets to be the gatekeeper of books that they feel are for people over the age of 18? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I feel like it's kind of just it's kind of discriminating against the authors that have some material that they because I have the same questions I'm looking at and I'm going, I don't know. When I was 17, I read some pretty racy stuff and i mean i don't know if if i if i click that box are they going to throw my book into another slush pile again and then consider me 
you know, an, an, an erotica author again? And am I going to have an issue where people can't find my books now because of this one scene that's in my book? I don't know. You and, know, so. Yeah, as you say, um, what gives them the right to be gatekeepers? Um, what gives them the right to, especially when we're trying to do it out of a sense of decency, when we're trying to sort of like say, look, there are parts in here that I wouldn't want a small child, I wouldn't want a child to read this particular scene of graphic murder, but it's integral to the plot. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. Sorry, I was just babbling because I agreed so much there. Um, oh, so, I like the conversations. <laughs> um, with your Edge of Reflection series and the Diablo Snuff series, it's clear that you've got an affinity for writing series fiction. What appeals to you about series fiction and how does it differ from writing standalone titles? It's, it's funny you say that because I'm actually trying to get away from series fiction. It's, uh, I, well, one of the reasons that I like horror so much is that you can still write standalone fiction. It's, to me, it's almost one of the only genres that allows you to do that now. I mean, with fantasy and science fiction and definitely with romance, you're expected to write a series. You can't, anymore, you can't really just write a one-off book. As soon as you do, someone says, where's the next one? And where's the next one? And you're expected to write a series now, at least a three-book series, at least a trilogy. With horror, you can still write a standalone book and then move on to the next one. And sometimes that's kind of refreshing to me to be able to write a book, move on to the next if I feel the need later to write a sequel, I can, but I don't need to go into it with a three book plot, you know, written out and ready. And, um, but I do, there is something to be said about a series. It is nice knowing that readers will return to your story and that you can have faith in your own story enough to know that readers are going to keep going with it. Um, the problem though, sometimes is, for example, The Maddening, which was my I believe the best book I've ever written. I mean, it's like 130,000 words. It's the biggest book I've written as a horror author. And like I said, the best book I've written, it's the fifth book in the Diablo Snuff series. And I think it's the least read book that I have. I mean, it has only probably, I think 25 reviews right now. Um, and it's just because it's the fifth book in the series. So no one's going to pick that up if they haven't read books one, two, three, and four. So you need that read through. So now I'm waiting on people who are still just discovering me to read books one, two, three, and four to be able to pick up the book that I like best of all my books. <laughs> you know? And so there's that that just kind of is frustrating at the same time because it's like, ah, like I really want somebody or people to read this. That's the one that right now is nominated for the Splatterpunk Awards. The other four books, I wrote them to where you could read them as kind of standalones, but the fifth book definitely needed to have, I wanted them all to kind of come together and meet with the fifth book and it wraps them all up and it's pretty cool. But now with the Edge of Reflection series, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm actually, that book isn't finished and that's that was my first series ever. Right. It still has probably probably at least two to three more books that need to be written and I just haven't written them. They've been sitting there for a while and I'm actually considering taking them down and writing them as, you know, the new Kindle Vela program. Yeah. I'm considering rewriting them and putting them up in serial format on Kindle Vela. I'm thinking about it. I've already written the first chapter of the first book to see how it would go and completely rewrote it. I mean, it's like not even the same book. I wanted to see what I would do with it now. Cause I mean, that book, I wrote that, God, that book started out as, as a screenplay. So, I mean, it was, I wrote that when I was in the military in like 1999 originally. So, I mean, it's, and Lost then, it, and I, yeah, then I wrote it out as a book, but it was very close to that screenplay. So, I mean, I haven't completely rewritten it like that since, I mean, until now really. So, wow. So, I wanted to see what would happen with it and what I could do now with it. And I think it would be really cool, but it's just time consuming, you know, to rewrite a whole, especially a whole series like that. So. Yes. It, yeah. I, <laughs> I can completely imagine. And I know what you mean as well, but um, with my tales from Innsmouth, um, some of the books that are in that, um, I mean, book three, absolutely love it. Um, book four, it's so academic in its function that I just, like it because it's quirky and it's not something that I've seen done before and yeah five starts to tie things up and you just think 
people are reading book one and maybe book two and yeah just why can't i put a gun to people's head to get them to hurry along to these other ones yeah it um, almost makes me wish book five it almost makes me wish the maddening i almost wish i hadn't written it as a book in that series i mean some of the because it actually has it is one novel but it has parts to it i'm not even sure what that's called when you have like kind of smaller books inside of one big book um i don't know what the term is for that but no i don't actually um segments chat books yeah like um, but but they all do come together i mean it is all one book but you know what i mean how it's like how there's book one book two book three in one book so it's all it could easily have been written as its own standalone book probably if i didn't tie it together with diablo snuff you know and it's like god it, it's just it kills me knowing that it, i think it's such a great book and it's just how many people may not read it because it's the last book in a series <laughs> so um, ah, but yes yeah i know yeah if i had hair i would be pulling it out uh, in <laughs> um Final question, Carver. What are you currently working on and where can we find more of your work? I'm currently working on, actually, right now, I'm going through final edits. Um, one thing, and it's kind of, actually, I'll mention it on here for your, your readers and for your authors and stuff that are working on something, and you may have mentioned it to them before. I don't know if other authors have mentioned it. Something that I really like doing that I just started doing over the last year or two, that kind of my final part of my own editing process when I'm writing is I love to use Microsoft Word's read aloud feature. Um, love it. I just love yeah. when I'm finally finished going through my own process, I put on headphones and I listen to the entire book just because I, it picks out stuff. And, and I've read through this, my own book like several times already. And I still pick out stuff like where I double up on words or I just things I missed reading, you know, skimming through it. And um, just listening to it, you pick up on things. And so that's the process I'm going through right now on it. And then I'll get it Isn't off. To a people. genius function from Word. Yeah, and not enough people use it. And it's crazy how I think I've always been a fairly good self-editor. I still have people help me out with cleaning it up and stuff afterwards. Yeah. But I'm so much better with that read aloud feature. Like, it's crazy the things that I still miss without, um, you know. I stick it on this computer, I get it to read it out. I've got um, an elliptical exercise uh, machine there. I go on that, I'm listening to it whilst I'm exercising. If I hear something that doesn't sound right, I get off and I can come over. And yeah, it's part of my exercise regime. I bloody love that, yes. And yeah, yeah. as you say, not enough people use it. It's, um, <laughs> it it's is just amazing. Great. So that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm actually finishing up a book called Faces of Beth. It's kind of a play on the old, I don't know if you remember the old Faces of Death uh, videos that used to be out. There's old documentaries of sick. Anyways, it's just a play on words, but it's Faces of Beth. And it's kind of a possession story. Um, I still, I, I wrote a blurb for it, but I don't have it. I should have had it handy actually to read it to you guys. But the um, it's kind of a possession story. But that's my new one in the works. I had, don't have it up yet for pre-order or anything like that. I'm still working on it. I'm not comfortable yet to put it up for pre-order um but that's the one that i have in in the works and will probably up, be up within a couple months i would think at least and oh, yeah. uh prior to that was the maddening that was the last one that i put out so those are my newest books out and the maddening's the one that's up for the um splatterpunk awards this year yeah that's the one that's out for so i would love it i mean if people like to read graphic graphic sex then <laughs> in their horror then start with the first book in the Diablo Snuff series. That's the that's a foreign evil, and that's a very short one. That's a short. No, that's like a novella form. It was never meant to be a series. It was supposed to just be a short novella. It does have, kind of leave you in a cliffhanger. Um, the sequel to that was never supposed to happen. But I had a nightmare one night that was very vivid. I've never had a nightmare like that since. It it almost laid out the entire the whole book. It was crazy. Almost everything in that book was from a nightmare. I got up and I hand wrote some notes real quick and then the sequel was born and then it became a series. So, yeah. I have never heard anything that's made me want to read a book more than this came from a nightmare. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> so another, pro another thing I messed up with that series and this is a mistake that I made that I'm still kicking myself for and I will fix it at some point is 
I numbered the books. There's part, there's a four and evil, which is part one. The grindhouse is part two. That's the one the dream came from. Then I had a side, I had a, wrote a book called passion and pain that I called a side story because it was, it was related to the, to the Diablo snuff, which is like a sinister kind of organization, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel it was strong enough to call it book three. So I made it like a side story um, kind of, and then, then I wrote a book called Slaughterbox, which I also, because it was really just one person story, one character story, I called it a side story and didn't call it like book three. And then I came out with The Maddening and it was book three. I mean, it was really related to the entire whole Diablo snuff. So then you've got book one, two, and three and these two side stories. But really you need to have read those side stories before you read book three. So do you see where I screwed up? I should yeah. have just labeled them one, two, three, four, and then five. But, yeah. and now people read books one and two, don't know they're supposed to read those side stories and then jump into the maddening and they're missing information because they didn't read those side stories. So on Amazon, I numbered them one, two, three, four, and five. But on the actual books themselves, they're labeled Diablo stuff, one, two, and then the maddening is three. The other two say side story. And it's just, I don't, it's kind of a mess. I need to fix that. But yeah. So many people have bought the paperbacks, you know, and stuff, and it's just something I need to work out the numbering on them. So it's uh, just <laughs> lessons learned, man. This is yeah. This is one of the things we work with words, not numbers. Um, and yeah, um, yeah. Somebody else should be doing the numbering for us. Yeah. Um, Carl, thank, thank you so much. That's been um, yeah. That's been entertaining and educational. That's been much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.